Hello music lovers, welcome back. Before we begin, I'd like to clarify that the title of this video is not a derogatory remark. I am not mocking the work of Mr. Fisher or any of the writing team on this track. Quite the opposite. This one's a banger. We'll look into the track at the end of the video. But first, we have to have a little chat about educational context. There was a fair amount of discussion on last week's Dead Mouse video around whether any of that chord cleverness was planned, with many of you citing excerpts from Dead Mouse's masterclass, in which he self-confessed not knowing much about chords or scales. I am aware of this. Joel often plays himself down when interviewed, but whether or not you know the names of things is not a measure of your musical intelligence, in my opinion. What's clear to me with Dead Mouse or Cascade is they do have good ear training. Even if that training just comes from listening to other artists that happen to use unusual chords, you still have to be exposed to that at some point to find it desirable. When Sergei Prokofiev once performed in the early 1900s, his new chords made the audience walk out of the theatre. They were disgusted. Harmony that is new to us can sound awful and alien. So, in my opinion, Dead Mouse and Cascade must already have an ear for interesting harmony in order to seek those chords out in the first place and hear their potential. So, story time. 17-year-old me studying music at A-level. By this point, I am already a full music geek. Music is all I cared about. I already had my A-star in GCSE music and had continued on to A-level, where one day we were learning something called Bach Harmony. And the teacher laid down a rule. We weren't allowed to do something called parallel fifths, which in other words meant this. If two notes were five apart, you weren't allowed to move them in parallel. Now, first of all, as a young metal guitarist, I was extremely offended, but I interrupted the teacher. I said, this isn't true. I've heard Bach use parallel fifths. The teacher pulled me to one side for some real talk. He said, I know, this isn't Bach's rules. These rules don't exist. This is simply a musical exercise dreamt up by an exam board so they can test you and give you a grade. He advised I should play along with the rules just to get my grade. And then after that, he said, you can do what you like. Now, fast forward many years, I now have a YouTube channel. Thanks to you guys, my wonderful community. I also have a great responsibility. Last month, Cyril B, or Cyrib, left this comment on my bass processing video, reminding me to be careful what I say, as beginners may take it as gospel. And he's right. Now I am that A-level teacher. I am now the danger. As a British person on the internet, trying to do my most polite, understandable accent, it can come across as quite authoritative. And these lessons are in danger of being taken as gospel. Yes, everything I advise is based in professional experience, but many times I am still giving rules of thumb. So let's have our own little real talk, shall we? We need to talk about rules of thumb. It's all too easy to forget that other people may not understand the phrases of the culture which you come from. So in the early days of the clothing trade, the width of your thumb could be approximated to be about one inch. Thus the phrase rule of thumb. These days, of course, it is now a generalization to mean an approximate method for doing something. So for example, all of my videos talking about chords, scales, harmony, melody, all of those lessons were given in the framework of one scale, staying within the one scale, something called diatonic harmony. Before I made the Dead Mouse video and made you aware that multitonality was a thing, 
If you had taken my lessons as gospel, you may have thought that making music in one scale was the only way it could be done. But that's not how art is made. Rules of thumb are just general guidelines, or hacks, if you will. The reason I teach the way I do is to give beginners a shortcut that will A, work most of the time, B, keep you out of trouble, help you avoid common beginner mistakes, C, just make it easier for you, and D, let you get on with starting the process before getting overwhelmed by all the possible options, permutations, and exceptions. I'm just pointing you in a good initial direction. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. There are many, many ways to make music. You could use a computer or not use a computer at all, what they call completely doorless. Both are capable of making great music. But would I recommend going doorless to a beginner? Absolutely not. Since beginning the channel, I've had plenty of requests on how to get started making music. Imagine if I responded, there's no rules, go and do what you like. Not very helpful. So finally, that brings us to Fisher's Take It Off. This track makes very little musical sense. Let me explain. Let's start with the bass. Looks like this. I'm just going to pull the MIDI down so we can analyze the MIDI on its own without changing the sound. Let's make this a bit easier to read. These are all just octave jumps. They're the same note, just up one octave. Let me change the octave so we can see everything on one line. So now we can see all four notes of the bass. Starts in D sharp. I would say D sharp is the tonal center. So that's our key. Let me move this to A so we can read it a little easier. Then we can judge where it falls versus the white notes, a minor scale. As you can see, not all white notes here. So it can't be minor. If you remember from the Tech House video, this second note being flattened here means this could be Phrygian. But then this note is from major. So it's a bit like that Dead Mouse track. It's not really in any one scale. Not an easily definable one, anyway. And that's fine. They don't have to be. If you remember in the Dead Mouse track, when things changed scale, everything followed. The chords, the bass, the melody. But here, hmm, not so much. Let me show you the stab. So we do have a D sharp in here, but the rest is not moving with the changing bass, you'll notice. This is a whole loop. This makes a D sharp minor chord. This note here though, that's not in D sharp minor. This is from D sharp Dorian. Okay, interesting. Also, nothing is moving when the bass is changing. So technically this F sharp here would be clashing with the bass when that moves to G, major to minor. This doesn't do it. So it is in D sharp, so it's related to the bass, but the rest of the harmony doesn't really match up. Let's look at the ARP thing. Yes, these are the exact notes. I worked them out one by one. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, hang on, let me loop this. So these notes are from a D sharp major seventh chord. Different again. Technically it fits over the first and fourth bass notes, but it's not changing with the bass. And this would be considered a direct clash with that stab sound. Now for the last drop, we have this big pad. And that is a D sharp minor seventh chord. And the whole thing is 
pitch bent upwards, up by a whole note to F, which gives us an F minor seventh there, which gives us notes that aren't in any of the other parts. Different again. The big lesson is, while none of this technically works on paper, does it work in practice? Absolutely. In terms of how this track was made, I'm quite sure it wasn't programmed in MIDI. Maybe the bass line, but the rest are probably audio samples. The vocal is spoken, so that doesn't have to be in any key. And the rest is probably just done purely by ear and feel. But can I really not explain this? Does it really have no scale? Can I not even explain it with multi-tonality? Well, no. Of course, if you give a musician enough time, they'll probably find a name for something. Humans do have an inherent desire to quantify things for knowledge. If you were to press me, I could tell you the bass line is probably in diminished dominant, maybe? <laughs> something like that. But look at this man. Now, please forgive my prejudice, but I'm going to take a guess and say that Paul Fisher is not the kind of man that wakes up one morning and says, Today, I'm going to write a track in diminished dominant. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure this track was made with a method I like to call press and guess. Again, I don't mean bad by that. That's not a pejorative term. Press and guess is just as valid as any other artistic approach. Some of the greatest tracks in history have been made this way. But as your teacher, it comes back to what I said earlier. For those of you seeking lessons on how to make music, telling you to just press and guess doesn't really teach you anything, does it? The paradox of my job here is I have to take pieces of art, reverse engineer them, and break them down into digestible info so we can all learn from it. But it does not mean that is the way it was achieved originally. It's just a repeatable explanation of the outcome. It's very much a know the rules to break the rules kind of thing. Press and guess is as good as any method for getting from A to B. It's just if you ever wanted to repeat that journey, it would have been nice to have some directions along the way. Thank you for watching. If you lasted this long, well done. That was quite the rant, wasn't it? <laughs> anyway, if you learned something, you know what to do. Press some buttons for me. If you're feeling extra generous, there's a link in the description to buy me a coffee. And until next time, I'll see you in the comments. Bye-bye.